This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with an extraordinary gentleman, Kishore Mabubani, who's currently the head of the Asia Peace Program. He's written many, many books. He served with the United Nations and with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Singapore. He has how would I say? He inspired me to read Ajay Chibber's book, who we made a chapter with because he had such laudatory uh, comments on the book jacket. I've learned a great deal from him over time, and I wanted to share his perspective on the 21st century Asia with you all. This is a book which I was alerted to by Singapore Straits Times. The Asian 21st century, in my mind, is at the center of very, very important geopolitics and what, what, what I would call challenges for humankind. And whether we're talking about climate or monetary systems or trade or intellectual property, it's all going to be embedded in the context that he explores brilliantly in this book. Kishore, thanks for joining me here today. My pleasure to join you, Rob. Let's talk about, you've written a number of books, Has China Won? Many, many things, many articles. I've followed your work for a long time. But this compilation seems to be saying something which you might call bigger and bolder. What inspired you to write this book at this time? The reason why I wanted to have this book out uh, at this point in time is that we we are often preoccupied with what's happening this month, this year, maybe even this decade. But we're not taking a longer look at the arc of human history and asking how the 21st century will be different from the previous two centuries. And it's, it's very clear uh, that the 21st century will be, as I say, the Asian 21st century. Uh, you know, and this is, you know, uh, a natural return of Asia, which I also emphasize because from the year one to the year 1820 or 1800, out of the last 2000 years, the two largest economies of the world were always those of uh, China uh, and India. And it's only in the last 200 years that Europe has taken off followed by North America taking off. By the past 200 years of world history, when you put it against the backdrop of the past 2,000 years of world history, have been a major historical aberration. Uh, all aberrations come to a natural end. So what we're going to see in the 21st century, the biggest theme will be the return uh, of Asia. And as you can know from the Western media, pays very little attention to it. But I'm very happy to learn, Rob, that the rest of the world is very interested in this story because this book was, uh, it's a free book. It's an, it's an open uh, access book. You can download it for free. It was released in January. And uh, after two months, there had been one million downloads of the book in 90 countries. One million downloads of the book in two months in 90 countries. And that made me aware that actually there is a deep hunger uh, in the whole world to understand, hey, we know an Asian century is coming. Well, why isn't anybody talking about it? So which is why I hope if my book can serve as a kind of a guide uh, into how Asians view the world very differently. And if it's going to be the Asian 21st century, and I'm certain it's going to be the Asian 21st century, then let's try and step into Asian perspectives and understand them. And I hope that's what my book will, will, uh, will, will contribute towards in terms of developing a better understanding of our contemporary world. Yeah. My uh, experience through various coincidences, I became friendly years ago with a gentleman named Chalmers Johnson who was at the time at Berkeley, and he had a um, a person that he turned me on to who sometimes goes by the name Patrick Smith, others Patrick Lawrence. And in about 2011, he wrote a book called Somebody Else's Century. 
And mm. uh, he was alluding to where you're filling in the gap, but he was seeing that changing of the guard as, uh, as a very, very powerful thing. And, and I know Chalmers was very enthusiastic about Patrick's vision and his work. In the first part of your book, you spend a lot of time on something that I think is very important. <clears throat> the United States has been a world leader since World War II. And as we approach the Asian 21st century, the question is, what is it about America that you would expect people to want to emulate or not? And I thought that your perspective from the vantage point of Asia you know, to put it in a silly way, is this the better mousetrap that we should try to become? Or given the deep philosophical history that's somewhat, how would I say, in tension with Cartesian enlightenment, it's a broader sense of, of, I guess, we and a little bit less of me. But when I look at that first part of your book, before we go into Asia, what is it that you see about the United States that would either attract or push away emulation by people everywhere, but particularly Asia? I would say the United States of America is still a great society. And it is still a greatly admired society uh, around the world because there are many aspects uh, of American society that make it uh, incredibly, uh, uh, you know, sort of admirable. I mean, you have the world's uh, greatest uh, university, you know, whether it's Harvard or Yale, Stanford or Princeton, uh, Columbia, you know, you have so many great universities. And you, you also have a remarkably uh, entrepreneurial society. I mean, you produce giant uh, world beating corporations uh, you know every decade uh, and you're also you're you're also the society that is best at bringing in migrants and integrating them into your society so you can have two of the largest corporations in America uh, Microsoft being run by Satya Nadella an immigrant from India or Google being run by Sundar Pichai an immigrant from India uh, that kind of openness uh, you will not find in China or India or Japan, as you know. So that all these aspects of American society uh, are, are truly amazing. And that's why the world continues to admire United States of America. That's why many young people around the world still aspire to go and live and work in uh, the United States of America. But at the same time, you know, there's also a growing awareness in the rest of the world that the United States is now developing some structural uh, weaknesses, you know. And I'll mention a few. One is, of course, the United States is clearly becoming a plutocracy. It's a government of the 1%, by the 1%, for the 1%. And I have an essay on that mm -hmm. uh, in my book. And, uh, the, and, and, and in the plutocracy, the, basically all the public policy decisions that are made uh, benefit the 1% and the rest are not benefiting at all. And that's why this is the second aspect of the United States, which I highlight in the book. The bottom 50% uh, in America have seen a stagnation in their incomes and standard of living uh, for three decades or so. And that's created what the Nobel laureate Angus Deaton calls the uh, deaths of despair. Uh, and, you know, it's very sad. So you have, on the one hand, some aspects of the uh, United States that are amazing, that the rest of the world continues to admire, and some aspects of it that shock the rest uh, of the world. And I think if John Rawls, the great American philosopher, were alive today, he would be actually quite shocked to see how far the United States has deviated from his vision, which was to create a socially just society where even people at the very bottom could aspire to reach the very top. Mm -hmm. And that's not happening. 
voting in the way that it used to happen in American society. In the context of this, what I'll call plutocratic structure, how did the, how do I say, experience of COVID-19 affect that? Did it, did it seem to be that America is starting to shift gears or did it seem to highlight the concentration of wealth and power and the suffering, therefore for many, was exacerbated in the, from your perspective? Well, I would say that, you know, uh, the, the the record of the United States and America uh, on COVID is, is, is mixed. Uh, uh, on the one hand, you know, the, when the word came out that there had been a new virus in China, uh, on the one hand, you know, the, when the word came out that there had been a new virus in China, and after the Lancet magazine published an article in January 2020 warning that a new virus was emerging, that we should start preparing for it. And uh, the rational response uh, by the United States, which is after all still you know, a modern, rational, uh, well-managed society, should have been to say, hey, what can we do to prepare for this? and deal with it. But as you know, President Trump, uh, who was your president then, was in a state of complete denial about uh, COVID-19. And what, what shocked the rest of the world is that the United States has always been a leader uh, in the field of science. And to have a president who refused to listen to scientific evidence on COVID-19, like, for example, that wearing masks would save lives, you know, something very simple as that. You know, he's something that he resisted uh, or that stay at home or isolation would help. Again, he resisted that for a long time. So that that was, that was, and that's why as a result of that, the, United, the number of deaths that the United States had from COVID-19 was amazingly high because as you know, uh, it had over 800,000 deaths or so when China had less than 5,000 deaths uh, from COVID-19. So that's the negative side of the ledger. But on the positive side, of course, the United States showed that it's still a scientific superpower because it came out with vaccines in record time. And indeed, you know, I myself got three uh, Pfizer shots. And I actually believe that it was American technology that saved my life personally. I'm very grateful that uh, the United States of America produced uh, the modern vaccines, and these vaccines have made a huge uh, difference to save a lot of lives uh, around the world. And now, actually, as you know, uh, finally, uh, after the stumbles and all that, the United States is emerging out of COVID-19. And, and surprisingly, uh, China is still struggling to get out of COVID. So, you know, it's, it's funny that some parts of United States on COVID-19 where it did badly and other parts where it has done very well. So it's a mixed record. Yeah. Well, and I agree with you about the uh, onset and Donald Trump. And I, th I think the dread of acknowledgement of a challenge of that scope when you were up for re-election was probably very daunting. Uh, but it's not a basis or an excuse for avoiding the responsibility. Yeah, and, and sadly, he was more focused on his re-election rather than being focused on the lives of the uh, Americans and saving yes. their lives. Yes. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about Trump. You, in the latter part of the first section of the book, you talk about how Trump affected China. And I'll, I'll just start with a, a touch of background from my own experience. I was watching... After the China 2025 vision came out, which was not what you might call just fall in line in a position of subordinate comparative advantage to American companies or European companies and multinationals, I saw the China 2025 as a vision of creating knowledge intensive industry and building on their own and moving to which you might call the front row of high value added. But I saw at the Council on Foreign Relations in the United States, people like Blackwell and Campbell and so forth, even before Trump's campaign, 
writing what I will call nationalistic uh, concerns. And obviously the lack of penetration, perhaps for cybersecurity reasons, of the internet platforms, companies from the United States into China was another facet. Uh, but I saw a great deal of resistance even on Wall Street because they weren't getting enough access to the development of the Chinese internal financial markets. So there there was a tension, what, what I'll call a changing of the guard in the role that China wanted to play relative to the role America wanted them to play. And it was evident even in 2014 and early 2015. But it seems like when Trump became president, there was something that uh, there's an economist, Dean Baker, in the United States who, who emphasizes he turned on the suffering that white blue collar workers in the Midwest had experienced and energized that and blamed it on China and Mexico rather than on the lack of adjustment assistance within the United States to the transformation related to globalization. So we have, we have this context in where Trump seemed to motivate the people with the despair that Angus Deaton and Ann Case wrote about. But how, how did he affect U.S.-China relations and what's the residual impact of his which you might call accelerating or amplifying the discord between those two major powers? Well, I would say, you know, it's uh, history, you know, is very strange. Uh, we often focus on individuals and individuals uh, do matter. Uh, but, you know, I've written a book, as you know, Has China Won on yep. uh, U.S.-China Relations? Uh, and in the very first paragraph, I say uh, that this uh, U.S.-China contest has been started by Donald Trump, especially when he launched a trade war against China in 2017, 2018. But I said he will outlast him. And sure enough, Trump lost the election. Biden won. He's reversed many of Trump's policies, but he's actually reversed almost none of Trump's uh, policies on, on, on China. And so, therefore, the, 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 the fundamentally, to understand the U.S.-China contest, it's important to understand the structural forces that are driving it. And clearly, uh, the, it's being driven by the fact that the United States, having been number one, the number one economic power uh, for 130 years plus, since about 1890s, uh, cannot accept the fact that it's going to become the number two uh, economic power sometime in the next decade or two. And so it is quite natural for the United States to try and stop China's rise, because that's what all great powers have done for thousands of years. <laughs> it's, it's logical great power behavior to retain its number one position. And I, I have no doubt that uh, if Hillary Clinton had won, she wouldn't have been as, uh, her administration wouldn't have been as rude and as insulting towards China as Mike Pence was or Mike Pompeo was, you know. Uh, but nonetheless, I think the US-China contest uh, would have continued to gain momentum. And we see this in the fact that Joe Biden is one of the nicest guys you can possibly have uh, as president, but his hands are tied and he cannot reverse uh, many of Trump's policies. And including, you know, you're, 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 you're a very distinguished economist, Rob. You know better than I do that <laughs> tariffs uh, don't hurt Chinese producers. Tariffs hurt American consumers. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you know it's sort of it's sort of bizarre that uh, you that that, that that this trade war was launched against any kind of sensible uh, economic uh, advice, you know. So it's so that that was of course that that that's something that Donald Trump 
uh, did. And and he, of course, he did it for only for domestic political reasons and also because he, uh, sadly, he, he doesn't understand economics, I think, Donald Trump, and doesn't understand the, the danger of tariffs. And I, and I actually heard a podcast uh, with uh, some one of his economic advisors, Gary Cohn, <laughs> uh, of, of uh, Goldman Sachs. Uh, and, and I've actually met Gary. And Gary said he tried so hard <laughs> to explain to Donald Trump why tariffs didn't work, why they were hurting American consumers, and why it wasn't good for the American economy. And he said he just couldn't change his mind. And so he one day he finally asked Donald Trump, so why, why, why are you insisting on tariffs? And Donald Trump replied, I like tariffs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh... I mean, it is actually quite shocking that the president of the world's most advanced society, the world's most educated society, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the world's best university, just didn't understand economics 101 mm-hmm. uh, on, on tariffs, you know. Yeah. And I think that's the damage. And of course, the, the 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 really sad part is that Trump is gone, right? A year, a year, and three months have gone by, and none of the none of these tariffs have been uh, removed. Yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, it would, it would serve America's national interest uh, to remove them. And right now, when the United States, as you know, is worrying about the threat of inflation, which is real. One of the few policy measures actually the United States government can take to fight inflation actually is to remove the tariffs uh, on Chinese products. And the tariffs, by the way, have not worked to reduce the trade deficit within US and China. In fact, the trade deficit within US and China has gone up <laughs> since the tariffs were introduced, you know. So it, it is sort of very, very strange to the rest of the world that, you know, for the United States, it has won more Nobel Prizes in economics <laughs> than any other society has. Uh, and the, the fact that you have the most number of Nobel Prize winning economists seems to have no impact at all on your public policies. <laughs> I think uh, Donald Trump, as you suggest, may not be a master of economics, but he is a master of political theater. And uh, I do think the uh, – how would I see? This is a man who came to America with a message. I'm running against essentially both parties, and the system is rigged. And the system is rigged. That's the plutocracy that you're referring to. People can feel that. They don't themselves, perhaps this is a lack of our education system, not our Nobel laureates, but the breadth of understanding. Uh, Our population wants to alleviate that despair. But the techniques of doing so, as you say, probably don't include much in the way of tariffs. So as I could see it, Joe Biden comes to town and he doesn't have other ways of reassuring people that he's going to alleviate their despair so they can't rescind the tariffs because the political theater of distress is what's dominant context. And he's got, I would, I would, how would I say, as a matter of patience, he's got to find a way out. And perhaps, as you're suggesting, rescinding those tariffs along the way is, well, I, I think it is overdue. Uh, no, his hands are tied by the fact that a very strong consensus has built up in the American body politic that the time has come for the United States to stand up to China and to stop China's rise. And what I find sad about the United States today is that even though in private, uh, many of your more thoughtful uh, American policymakers, many of your more thoughtful uh, American opinion makers realize that this this zero-sum 
uh, contest approach to China is not a wise one. And that if you need China's help on things like uh, climate change and earlier on on fighting COVID and now dealing with a possible global economic recession, and you, in that case, you know, you need to work out a more balanced uh, approach towards China, which is what I advocate in my book, uh, where you compete with China in areas where you have to, where you cooperate with, in areas in, in, in with China in areas where we should benefit ordinary Americans. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The ordinary yes. Americans would be better off uh, with a combination of competition and, and cooperation. But as you can tell, that doesn't get votes at all in the uh, United States. And so it's almost impossible to find a politician that can make a reasonable speech uh, on, on, on China today. And this is why quite often, as you know, uh, that's why economics alone is not enough. You need good economics and you need good politics if you're going to have good public policy. Yes, that's one of the premises of uh, this organization, INET, which is politics and economics are inseparable. They cannot be <laughs> looked at. The world needs you. <laughs> well, we, we'll keep uh, we'll keep putting our shoulder to the wheel. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit. The next uh, phase, we've talked quite a bit now about the challenges in the United States. Paint the picture for us of the Asian Renaissance, the next phase of your book, the dawn of the Asian century, what's happening with ASEAN, the role of India, and then we'll come back to China. Well, I think, uh, you know, I uh, was born and brought up in Singapore. And, you know, when I was born, Singapore's per capita income was about the same as Ghana's, about $500, you know. And Singapore was a poor third world country. And uh, I, I lived in a poor family in a poor third world country. So at the age of six, I was put in a special feeding program because I was technically undernourished. And I can tell you that I always say in my life, the biggest turning point came uh, when we got a flush toilet at the age of 13. Because the sense of your, your, the dignity, the sense of dignity in your life improved dramatically when you could just flush it away instead of having to wash this mound grow uh, in the course of a day in a can uh, that never moved. So, you know, so that's, that's the kind of uh, escape from poverty that I have personally experienced uh, in my life. And uh, that's what uh, hundreds of millions of Asians are experiencing. You know, and since I actually experienced, you know, real third world poverty, I understand how e emancipating it is. Huh? to be liberated from poverty. And the fact that China has, you know, um, uh, saved 800 million people, <laughs> more than double the population of United States from poverty is a remarkable achievement. I think when future historians write about our era, that's what they will write about. And, and so I, in my lifetime, I've seen remarkable changes uh, uh, in Asia, you know, including especially in Singapore, which has gone from a poor third world developing country to having a per capita income, which I think may even be higher than that of the United States, you know. Uh, so you can see what a remarkable journey Singapore has done. But Singapore is like what they call the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> So what Singapore has accomplished, the rest of Asia uh, is now uh, accomplishing. And of course, as, 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 in, as in sort of what we have seen through all of human history, first you have a kind of a economic rejuvenation uh, of societies, and then that's followed by, uh, you know, a cultural renaissance, a sense of discovering their identity, a sense of rediscovering their roots. And that's what's also happening 
throughout Asia. And in one, one of the biggest facts about Asia that many in the West are not aware of is, is how diverse Asia is, you know. Uh, you have China and, of course, the related Confucian societies like South Korea to some extent, Japan to some extent, but then you have uh, Southeast Asia, which is the most diverse part of uh, planet Earth because among 680 million people, you have 250 million Muslims, 150 million uh, Christians, 150 million Buddhists, Mahayana Buddhists, Hinayana Buddhists, you have Hinduists, Taoists, uh, Confucianists, and even communists in Southeast Asia. So it's a very diverse region, and, and, and all these regions are doing well. And let me just give you one, one statistic to illustrate this. In the year, everyone knows that Japan is a major global power, economic power, right? It's, it's a really significant global economy. In the year 2000, Japan's economy was eight times the size of the 10 ASEAN countries in Southeast Asia in the year 2000. By 2020, it was only 1.5 times larger. By 2030, ASEAN will become larger than uh, Japan. And in 30 years, right? Isn't that amazing? That is extraordinary. And nobody knows about it. Nobody yeah, knows. That's right. No, I've this never heard and, that comparison same, before. Yeah, at the same time, the middle classes, new middle classes are being built. And there is a tremendous sense of, uh, optimism for the for uh, for the future among many young people all through this region, you will find this optimism in China. You will find this optimism uh, among uh, among the 1.4 billion people in China, among the 680 uh, million people in Southeast Asia, and among the 1.3 billion people in India. And you just add those uh, three figures I mentioned, you come to almost half the world's population. Mm -hmm. And almost half the world's population is now enjoying a new kind of optimism which they haven't experienced in centuries, right? And, and that's, that, again, is a massive change yes. in world history. And, 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 and unfortunately, because Western societies do a lot of navel-gazing, they feel their own pessimism and they don't understand that a population that is like four, or five, uh, three or four times the size uh, of the, the West combined has now suddenly begun to feel optimistic. And, and they don't understand that. <laughs> they don't see it. They're not aware of it. And that's why I think this book is so, is so critical because it, it opens windows into big developments that are happening that many in the West are not aware of. Yes. I've, uh, Mike Spence and uh, Montek Singh Alawali and I did a talk one day uh, about the ramifications of the lessons, these really extraordinary experiences in Asia for African development, because there's so much concern. You were talking about population growth. International Office of Migration is projecting an enormous increase in African population between now and 2075. A, lot, a good portion of the continent is what you might call an equatorial region. Global warming threatens subsistence farming. So social stability, migration, even the, what you might say, East Asian development model, infant industry protection, learning by doing, is threatened by global supply chains and automation. But Mike and Montek had some very, very insightful perspective on there are other ways to develop in Africa now and we can learn from Asia and I think that's I think that's a very important contribution to another large portion of mankind is the the example that you've set and the kind of things you've underscored here in the last few minutes that's why I was very happy when I saw that among the uh, over one million downloads uh, of my book in two months, uh, there were quite a few downloads in in Africa too, and you know the 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 uh, the Africans I think uh, 
are particularly appreciative uh, of the fact that China is coming to them with concrete projects on how to improve their societies, you know. So, uh, so the Chinese are building roads, bridges, railways, and at the end of the day, all these things make a huge difference, you know. And your sense of self-esteem improves a lot when you see your infrastructure uh, improving in your uh, society. And and China is the only country going around uh, building this new uh, infrastructure uh, all over Africa. And that's why you notice that uh, whenever China hosts a China-African Leaders Summit, uh, virtually all the African leaders turn up because they understand that they can now cooperate with uh, China in a positive sum game. And also it gives, and to be fair, it gives the Africans uh, alternatives because uh, when the West was dominant, the West either colonized uh, and trampled on Africa, but even after they were decolonized, the African states were bullied. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think you must know that Joe Stiglitz has a story in, in one of his books about how the Ethiopian government was penalized by the uh, World Bank because it repaid an, a loan early to American banks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember, I mean, I remember when Joe was talking that, yeah. that, you know, when a, when, a, when a poor country pays a high interest rate loan early, to an American bank, it gets punished, punished by the World Bank. Now, that, that's the kind of thing that Africans know about. So when China comes along and provides an alternative, uh, it's, 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 it's positive for Africa. But it's also, by the way, also very positive for Europe. Because one statistic I give the Europeans is that in the year 1950, Europe's population was more than double that of Africa's. Today, Africa's population is more than double that of Europe, much more than double. And by 2100, Africa's population will be 10 times the size of Europe. And, you know, it's, if the Europeans really thought long-term about what is the number one challenge to European societies in the long run, the number one challenge to society to Europe in the long run is that if Europe doesn't export jobs to Africa, Africa will export Africans to Europe. I mean, it, it's inevitable. It's, you can't stop it, you know? So therefore, when China invests in Africa, it is actually doing the Europeans a, a major favor because it is creating jobs in Africa that will keep Africans uh, in Africa. And I'm glad, actually, in some ways, there's a new competition among the Asian states uh, within China and India and Japan and South Korea to invest more in Africa. And I think that's very positive for the Africans. And actually the biggest beneficiaries of this paradoxically will be the Europeans. And, and if the Europeans were wise, they would partner the Asian countries in investing in Africa. I'm reminded of the uh, feature film in China, Wolf Warrior Two, which mm. talked a great deal about that brutish colonialism and mm. metaphorically the role of the Chinese mm. in lifting up the spirits of the Africans. And at one point that was, uh, people told me they thought that film, partly because of the scale of the Chinese population, that that film would be seen more than Star Wars or E.T. Cumulatively, uh, it, it would hit the all-time top five list, uh, and, and I know it got off to a very good start uh, in the spirit that you're describing. The uh, let's let's talk a little bit about India. You had some very interesting uh, sections in your Asian Rise chapter. India may be the best bet for moral leadership. Let's discuss where 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 does that vision derived from? What do you see? Well, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, Asia, as you know, and, and, and to some extent, we, we are guilty of it. We have talked a lot about China. But the, there are two big stories in Asia. I would say three big stories. I would say China, India, and ASEAN. 
uh, and I would call it the new CIA, China, India, ASEAN. <laughs> uh, the so um, the in the Indian story, I think is equally important, and India is also uh, undergoing a major transformation. You know. Now, the Indian economy clearly hasn't grown as fast as the Chinese economy because in the year 1980, the Indian economy and Chinese economy was about the same size, you know. 1980, India may have been slightly bigger too. But today, uh, China's economy is five times the size of India. And that, on the one hand, can be a source of despair on the other hand, it can be a sign of sign of hope because then what what China has accomplished today, India can accomplish tomorrow because in by any sense, and I say this, you know, I'm not a Chinese. I'm actually ethnically Indian. <laughs> so as an Indian, I know that Indians are capable uh, of being as productive in economic terms uh, as the Chinese are. And so I'm an, an also equally bullish about the prospects of the uh, Indian economy. Of course, if the right economic policies uh, are put in place. And my only criticism of India is that it refuses to plunge into the ocean of globalization in the same way that China has done so. Because if India did so, India would do as well uh, as China. And I think one of the saddest things that's happened is India's refusal to join the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the world's largest free trade agreement, which actually just took off in January 2022, two months ago. I think if India could make that switch, uh, India would have tremendous potential too. But despite that, I think India's economy will still do well. And of course, India today has the advantage of having a new kind of political stability because, you know, as you know, India has had uh, lots of changes in government and political instability of various kinds. Now you have a leader, Narendra Modi, that, who commands a tremendous amount of popularity in India. And just recently, he won the elections spectacularly in uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, the most populous state in India. So it's, it's likely that you know uh, Modi will remain the uh, uh, prime minister of India for the next five to ten years. And as you know, what's interesting about Prime Minister Modi is that on the one hand, uh, he relates well with the uh, Western world, but on the other hand, he never wears a Western suit, never wears Western garb, and he's very keen to revive. Uh, traditional uh, Indian culture. And that's also part of the renaissance uh, that is happening. And, you know, the, the, the thing about India is that if you're looking for a country that can be a bridge between the East and the West, it's, it, that, that country is probably uh, India because it's obviously it's got very deep uh, Asian roots, uh, it's linked to its fellow uh, Asian countries, and yet it has a uh, Westminster-style uh, parliamentary uh, democracy. Uh, a large part of its population speaks English. Uh, Indian migrants have done very well in advanced Western societies like uh, United States, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, and so on and so forth. Uh, the treasurer of the... Uh, uh, United Kingdom is an Indian Rishi Sunak. So you can see how uh, Indians uh, have done very well in the West too. So if there's one society that can build bridges uh, between the East and the West in the 21st century, uh, it's India. And, and I think that's what uh, the West should, that's, why, that's another reason why the West should be working very closely with, with India uh, in the 21st century. And uh, how do you see the role of India in the challenge of climate change? Obviously, given their size and scale, they're, they're a very important dimension. But how do I say asking people to stop burning carbon and st perhaps stop the pace of development while others are burning a lot more carbon from having 
uh, like the United States, already been there. How, how, what is the role of India in this in this challenge? Well, I think clearly, uh, if India is not part of the solution, uh, India is clearly part of the problem. And uh, but what I what I notice is that many Western analysts point to the fact that all the new flows of greenhouse gas emissions uh, are coming from uh, China and India, which is true. But as you know, climate change is happening not just because of the new flows of greenhouse gas emissions, but because of the stock of greenhouse gas emissions that have been put up in the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. And, you know, if you look at the overall stock, I, my, my figures may be wrong, but they're roughly right. I think the United States has contributed about 25% of the stock. I mean, the European countries, probably another 20 to 25%. I think China is still about 11 or 13 percent, and India is only about two or three percent. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a bit unfair to penalize India and ask India to do more in uh, climate change because many Indians still don't have electricity. Right. You know, and you notice that many countries are happy to fight climate change as long as they don't have to make any sacrifices. Uh, I mean, if you look at the two of the richest countries in the world, like Canada and Australia, on a per capita basis, they contribute a tremendous amount to climate change. But Canada is one of the richest countries in the world, will not give up its tar sands project in Alberta. And, you know, but that, that's not fair. I mean, why are you asking a poor country like India, uh, whose per capita, per capita income is still very, very low, uh, to make sacrifices when rich countries like Canada and Australia with very high per capita contributions to climate, uh, to greenhouse gas emissions are not willing to make economic sacrifices. And that's why you notice that on the issue of uh, climate change, actually there has been, uh, there have been lots of political differences within China and India in many areas. But on climate change, uh, they both have been cooperating with each other to try and persuade the West to be more reasonable in what it expects. But the good news is that the Indians accept the fact that they have to do something about climate change and they're trying going to try and make a contribution. Hmm. We see, uh, you know, we as the United States, as you described the plutocracy, we have a rich and poor country at the same time. And what many are seeing here, Robert Pollan or uh, John Powell or Manuel Pastor, is that the fear of transition is a really, really big, how do I say, um, obstacle to transformation of the U.S. energy structure. In West Virginia, coal miners have said to people like Robert Pollan, well, look what they did with globalization and so forth to, to Detroit and Cleveland. Are you, we going to sit by and say, oh, we're going to join the team for climate change and watch them trample us? In other words, the transformational assistance so that we're all on the team is missing in the United States. And uh, I think that uh, some of these scholars who I just mentioned are really at the vanguard of talking about removing the obstacles through greater social justice. Now, this is where, frankly, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you objectively analyze uh, why the jobs have been lost in the United States, and it's very sad that uh, jobs are lost in the United States, it's, it's partly because of globalization, but it's also because of technology. And, and, and the most importantly, public policies in the United States uh, do not provide support to employees who have to retrain themselves. And, you know, Singapore is the other extreme. Uh, Singapore understands that in, in, if you want to compete in the global world, uh, some industries will succeed, some industries will fail. And for the ones that fail, don't try and support them by subsidizing them. You have to let them die because they cannot compete. But what you do is you provide uh, support for the workers so that they can retrain themselves and join new industries. And that's something that is very, very difficult for, uh, uh, for the United States to do. And it's a bit sad, you know, but that, that's a result of plutocracy 
where you you provide uh, funding, for example, to very rich American farmers. <laughs> you provide huge subsidies to them because they have a lot of political clout, but you provide very few subsidies to poor workers in Detroit and Michigan who need to be retrained to uh, try to take on new jobs. Yep. That, uh, I, think, I think that's a formidable part of our challenge, not to mention we've turned what used to be called tax evasion into tax avoidance, meaning people can keep their money offshore and then they can complain we don't have the means to improve the public school programs. So the younger generations, many of the diseases of despair are the older talking about their children do not have the rungs in the ladder to move out of this of this rut. And uh, so there's a great deal of uh, what you might call structural challenge. I remember years ago, and I won't mention the person by name, but a very high level Chinese leader and I met and uh, he said to me, you know what's really, really troublesome to me? I said, what it? Well, yes or what? He said, it's that we don't have the power to create the adjustment assistance that America needs to deal with, as you said, technology and globalization. And we're being demonized. And what really should be demonized is the American political system for not taking care of its people. We have no power over that. I thought it was a fascinating observation. It was quite. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't. It wasn't anger. It was humble, in when he was saying. I think, and I think the United States can still, you know, American workers can still compete with the rest of the world if they're given the right training and assistance to do so. Well, as you come to the last part of this book, what's the peaceful rise of China? Where is China now, and how are they? Operating in this context, we see Hong Kong, we see the Ukraine, which, uh, but we see the aftermath of Trump. We've alluded to some of these things through this conversation, but what's the picture of China at this juncture in your in your mind? Well, I think um, uh, 2022 is proving to be a very difficult year for China. Uh, and... Uh, it's, it's got two major challenges this year. The first major challenge is that it is struggling to get out of its zero COVID policy. I mean, the zero COVID policy in many ways worked well for China because it saved, frankly, millions of lives. Uh, because if, if, if China had had the same number of deaths per, uh, per head, per million, a people as the United States, uh, instead of having uh, 5,000 deaths, uh, it would have probably had 5 million deaths at least because its population is uh, more than four times that of uh, United States. So uh, clearly, a zero COVID policy of China has saved a lot of lives. But right now, they have to come out of it. Uh, because there's no way you can keep an economy closed for so long. And so that's going to be number one challenge for China in 2022. And then the second challenge it faces is a result of uh, Ukraine. Because in many ways, uh, Ukraine has been a major setback uh, for China on several counts. Number one, uh, its partner, its strategic partner, its number one strategic partner to balance, in a sense, United States and Europe was Russia. Now, clearly, uh, Russia has been weakened, uh, is bleeding in Ukraine. So that is a setback for China. Secondly, the Ukraine war has also destabilized the global economy. And as you know, growth prospects for countries around the world are going to come down because of the uh, aftershocks of the Ukraine war and the sanctions that have been put on Russia. And so at a time when China is already struggling to achieve 5.5% growth, the Ukraine war is going to make it even harder to achieve that goal of 5.5% growth. And then thirdly, uh, China has been trying uh, very hard to deal with the United States 
and Europe as two independent poles in a multipolar world. And it's easier for United for China to deal with the United States and Europe separately rather than as a combined force. But one of the results of the uh, Ukraine war has been a complete, has been a tremendous regalvanization of Western solidarity. Uh, and the United States and Europe have come together very, very forcefully. And of course, the Europeans are very grateful for American assistance. But at the same time, the United States will say, hey, you know, we saved your bacon uh, on Ukraine. Please join our side on China. And, and that's okay, clearly another setback uh, for uh, China. And then fourthly, uh, the United States itself, you know, was feeling uh, uh, a sense of, you know, uh, uncertainty uh, about the future, about, you know, where it's heading and so on and so forth. But the fact that it is now succeeding, uh, it has succeeded in crippling uh, Russia so effectively has enhanced the self-confidence of American policymakers also. And, and here, this brings me to the, one of the other important things, the fifth point, which is that uh, I think what's really shocked the Chinese more than anything else is not the military assistance uh, that the West has been given to Ukraine, because that has obviously damaged the Russians uh, clearly. But the fact that the United States and Europe could seize half the assets of the Russian Central Bank and over $320 billion was just boom, gone, just like that. Now, if Russia has got $640 billion in reserves, China has got $3.2 trillion in reserves. So suddenly, all those U.S. Treasury bills that uh, China bought, thinking this provided China leverage against the United States of America, that these U.S. Treasury bills have can, are now can now become hostages to fortune. And that's a major reversal and setback for, for, for China. So I, I, I think this, this, the, this huge weaponization of the U.S. dollar uh, has, on the one hand, revealed a major asset for the United States. But on the other hand, uh, it's going to lead to the Chinese and many other countries thinking, how do we reduce our reliance on the U.S. Yes, yes. And, yeah, and the that's going to become the next big thing. And, and this is why I thought it's very unwise of the U.S. to weaponize this U.S. dollar, because if, if, if ever the day comes, may not be in my lifetime, that the U.S. dollar is no longer the global reserve currency, then, as you know, the United States will lose an exorbitant privilege because they can no longer print money yes. to buy Chinese goods. Yes, yes. When we, uh, I, in my imagination, I envision bringing you to Washington and we walk into the White House and you sit down with President Biden. You may have already done this, but in my imagination, what, what would you tell him Given your understanding of what's happening in Asia, I don't mean like you and I talked about earlier with Trump, the political theater, though that's a dimension of it, but deep down inside, how does the United States make a better America and a better world in light of what you understand about Asia? The big message I would convey is that the world wants to see a strong United States and not a weak United States. So the world wants to see him succeed uh, in his mission of strengthening and rejuvenating the United States. But the best way to do it is not to engage in a, in a, in a trade war uh, with China, not to engage in a zero-sum contest with China, but actually to work with China and the rest of East Asia to boost the global economy, because by doing that, then he'll be creating jobs in the United States and he'll be uh, creating a stronger uh, United States of America. So, and, and, and the, the real tragedy here is that 
The reason why Asians, many Asian countries now believe in free trade is because they learned the virtues of free trade from the great American universities. These are, these are American ideas that are propelling the, uh, the rise and return of Asia. And the United States should believe in its own ideas of free trade and come back and rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But all this, of course, you need to explain to the American people that they shouldn't be afraid of the return of China. They shouldn't be afraid of the return uh, of the rest of Asia because the, the, in the Asian 21st century, the Asians will send a big thank you note to the United States of America and say, thank you very much. Uh, it was your ideas that have enabled us to succeed and, and do so well. And many of the countries in, in East Asia and in South Asia want to partner United States and work with the United States, but more in the economic realm. And that's where the United States should focus on. Well, I'll give a little uh, backward-looking congratulations to our friends in Great Britain as well, because people like mm -hmm. Adam Smith and David Ricardo got that's these right. things moving. But uh, of but I, right. I, I got, really... You must, you must thank Adam Smith. <laughs> Uh, but what I really like, I, I'm thinking in the uh, analogy to the current uh, health situation. I see this book, 21st Century Asia, that you've written and distributed freely as a vaccination for the minds of the world against the disease of the breakdown of trade and the nationalistic brutality that might emerge. And so I think everybody should receive this mental vaccine and read your book. It's an extraordinary achievement. It really relates to the depth and the breadth of your experience and your wisdom. And uh, in particular, I'd really like you to come back and at some point do a big lecture with my Young Scholars Initiative, because that's who we're passing the baton to in the next chapter and uh, getting them vaccinated in the mind, uh, I think would be very good for the health of this world. Thank you. I'll be very, very happy uh, to do so. I remember very fondly my visit to your institution when we did our first <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, a dialogue together and I'm very happy to have this second dialogue with you and I'm very much looking forward to our third dialogue in New York yeah. well thank you for making this additional chapter with me today we'll keep an eye on your writing and elevate that as uh, I think is it. like I said it's extraordinary but thanks for giving me uh, an hour of your time today to uh, continue to nourish our audience. Thank you.